Good evening. My name is Kevin LaFrancois, and I am a Kevin Harrington Student Ambassador here at the Institute of Politics and Political Library. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students here at the Institute, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event. The Institute's mission is to engage and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in our democracy. However, the Institute does not endorse political issues or candidates. Before we start tonight's program, I would like to remind you to please turn off all cell phones or devices that make any such noises. Um, there will be a question and answer session after the event. The mics are located at the back of the room. Um, we ask that you stand directly in front of the mic and speak right into them. On behalf of the New Hampshire Institute of Politics, I would like to welcome Mr. Pat Griffin, who will be moderating tonight's event with Alex Castanis, um, who is the new Republican event. Mr. Griffin is the New Hampshire political analyst who is the founding partner, chairman, and CEO of Griffin, York, and Krauss, which is the largest advertising, strategic communications, and integrated marketing firm in northern New England. His practice has worked for many high-profile Republicans, such as former President George H.W. Bush, President George W. Bush, former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney, and Senator John Sununu. He has provided political commentary and analysis for MSNBC, CNN's Inside Politics, Fox News, and NPR. In addition, he is the author of Pay No Attention to That Man Behind the Curtain, How Technology Has Made Traditional Advertising Obsolete, which discusses mass media advertising and how it no longer works. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me to introduce Mr. Pat Griffin. I almost knocked over our guest and the podium over there on the way in. Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to see everyone here tonight and welcome once again to the place I always refer to as the epicenter of politics, not just in New Hampshire, but well beyond that. Um, tonight, um, we welcome a, a very, very special guest and uh, someone who I am pleased to call uh, a very dear friend. Um, Alex Castellanos has nearly three decades of political and private sector consulting experience in the US and across the globe. Alex has developed communication strategies and campaigns for some of the world's largest companies and brands. He's helped elect US senators, governors, and he's also helped elect presidents. I can tell you this personally because he and I first met each other in 2000. How many people were born in 2000? <laughs> See, this is like talking about working for Abe Lincoln. But it was uh, George H.W. Bush was running for re-election, and Alex and I met. And um, we were working on media together here in New Hampshire. And Alex came up. The president was being challenged by Pat Buchanan. We were in trouble. Alex came up with a film crew with another pal in the mind by the name of, of ours, by the name of Mike Murphy. And we went to Portsmouth to shoot people on the street to say nice things about President Bush. Well, President Bush was in real trouble. Um, and, and it took an awful lot of people on the street to try and get people who weren't giving us um, one-fingered welcomes and saying bad things. Uh, but we did find some people, and in Portsmouth, I'll never forget Alex Castellanos with a film crew, um, I think his name was Peterson, who, Tom Peterson? Bob Peterson. Bob Peterson, a great uh, photographer, had, a, had his film camera, in those days we shot on film, and uh, we were looking for people, and we came up to this really dark biker bar. And there were some rough characters going on out of there. And Alex said, let's go in there. I think we can get people to say nice things about the president there. Now, we're in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, in a biker bar. And Alex said, come on, let's go, let's go. So everybody followed Alex to the door of this place. He opened the door and went in. And one by one, we all kind of just sort of stood back. And it took about 20 seconds or so and the door reopened and Alex said, I think they're all Democrats. <laughs> and we moved on. Um, Alex is a guy who has uh, founded a company called Purple Strategies in Washington. Uh, the company has offices around the country. Uh, Purple is a uh, bipartisan public affairs uh, firm. Alex appears regularly on uh, television. You may have seen him as a regular contributor to Meet the Press and also is part of CNN's best political team on television. Um, I'll tell you the difference between me and Alex Castellanos. In 2007, I was named by Field and Stream magazine 
as one of the top 50 most influential people in New Hampshire. In 2007, GQ magazine named Alex one of the 50 most influential people in Washington. So there's a big stature gap tonight. <laughs> Alex has been a fellow at the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School at Harvard. He's also been credited with the discovery of what was well known during and, and after the Clinton era as the soccer mom, which we've talked a lot about, the, the role of women in politics, their influence as voters and as consumers of political candidates and co political uh, communication. He's also been called, and this is something I don't know if he'd want on his tombstone, the father of the attack ad. And I'm sure you'll have some questions about that later. A native of Havana, Alex is fluent in Spanish, and by the way, for those of you who didn't know, tonight's entire presentation will be done in Espanol. So try and follow, as well as English. His parents, refugees, were refugees who fled Castro's Cuba in 1961 and came to this country with one suitcase, two children, and $11. If anybody represents the American dream, it is my friend, Alex Castellanos. Please welcome him. Piece of advice, never follow Pat Griffin. Y si, todo va a ser en español esta noche por la próxima cuatro horas. It's good to be here with you. I appreciate it. Uh, talk a little politics, especially to be here at the first toll booth in America's political highway. That's you guys, the Institute of Politics here at St. Anselm's. Um, my name is... Alejandro Castellanos del Valle, and as you can tell from that, I am a member of one of America's most beleaguered minorities. I'm a Republican. <laughs> there are a few of us left. Um, I am, as Pat noted, part of the uh, best political team that calls itself the best political team on CNN. We don't take chances with that kind of stuff. And on CNN, I get to try to provide, at least for the past five or six years now, I've gotten to provide a little balance uh, to my good friend Paul Begala and James Carville. Um, and I'll, <clears throat> I have to say, Begala has turned out, to my surprise, to be a great guy and a good friend. Paul is, uh, well, he's remarkably wrong about everything, <laughs> but he, one of the best people you'll ever meet. Good dad, good friend. I know that if my house burned down tonight and I needed to call somebody, I know I could call Paul Begala and he'd be there. And I would ask him why Carvel burned my house down. <laughs> that fellow is a different animal. He's um, the uh, best description I've heard of Carvel came from my friend uh, Roger Ailes, who said, uh, that boy swam too close to the nuclear power plant, didn't he? Well, I think so he did. Well, we're going to talk a little bit. We, in, our, in our four hours that we have allotted to us, we're going to talk a little bit about politics and uh, the party I, had to I happen to belong to, the Republican Party, which is in somewhat need of repair. Um, we'll start with a cheery note. The discussion these days seems to be mostly, gee, what do we write on their tombstones, those Republicans? They're dead, right? Uh, somehow we have managed to become the pro-rape, anti-sex party. That should be kind of hard to do. But we've managed to pull that off. We, uh, but now to add to it, we seem to also be becoming uh, the party that wants to push America to the edge of an economic precipice, jeopardize the full faith and credit. This would be the oh no slide. This is our favorable rating, an unfavorable rating of the Republican Party, 58. But that was last week. We're working our way up here, trying to get that to over 60. I think we're doing a pretty good job. But that's what every candidate we have starts with. That's what's shackled to their ankle, the Republican brand. Every policy we advance as Republicans has this wrapped around it. The good news is that it's not a small problem. It's 
one big one. It's with every. It's going to hit everybody, kind of like an asteroid. Uh, young people think we're scary. Women who care think we don't. Latinos believe that uh, our party is biased, biased against Hispanics. Basically, everybody thinks we're the old, cold, soulless party of big business. We got them right where we want them. So about uh, 2010, I wrote a piece for National Review called The New Republican. Bought a website, newrepublican.org. What is it that Republicans believe is, is how do we become a party again that people might want to join? Right now, we're working with a lot of folks, the RNC, the RGA, the Republican governors, congressmen, senators trying to chart a path forward, and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about tonight. But if you look at the data, um, let's just say there's a lot of opportunity to improve. Where's America? What, where, is our, where is all this happening today? How do we feel about our country and our future? Right now, if you ask Americans if the next generation is going to be better off, most Americans by far say no. 53%. A country that's always been fairly optimistic feels much less so. How do we explain that and how do we move beyond that? I'm going to share with you tonight Alex's map of America. I'm graphically impaired, so please be gentle. But this is a map. I actually sell this to corporate America for large amounts of money. It's a great country. Okay, are you ready? Okay. That's it. That's Alex's map of America. Why is this a map of America? Because America has always thought itself ascendant. We have always thought tomorrow would be better than today, that our kids would have more opportunity than we would. That if you worked hard, played by the rules, you know, You'd have a better day tomorrow. You'd build something. That's who we've been. The guy who helped design the Jeep Cherokee is a French researcher named Clotaire Rappé. It's okay for him to have a name like that. He's French. Clotaire came over here and he studied these Americans. He said, my God, these are restless people. They are all about what's next. This huge country, vast networks of roads, they're always going somewhere. Americans can't sit still. And so he made the headlights on the Jeep Cherokee round because they're the eyes of a horse. And they've sold a heck of a lot of Jeep Cherokees to this restless, forward-looking country for over two decades. That's who we have been. We see ourselves as ascendant until recently. And as you just saw in that data, more Americans think our best days are behind us. More Americans think our kids won't have those opportunities than do. Now, Americans don't think we've declined yet. We don't think we've fallen. But what is the rational response when you think you're losing, when you think you're in decline? Protect me. Right? Job security, employment security, health care security. Protect me from the dreaded 32 ounce soda. <laughs> the nanny state, protect me. That's the democratic campaign for leadership in America. Security. What is a Republican campaign? No, it won't work. It'll accelerate decline, it'll make it worse. But are we really that different than the people we used to be not that long ago? Is all hope lost? Are Americans happy facing decline? Do we want to continue losing? No. What's missing? What's missing is somebody who's going to lift your eyes over the horizon and say, follow me, there is a better place. How do we know this? Okay, nice theory, Alex. Great. But how do we know this? Because Americans vote on it every day with what they buy. What are the great American brands people can't get enough of? 
Hint, hint. Google, Apple. You can name others. Why? Why are the Washington doesn't want to mess with them? Consumers hunger for them. Why? They're ascendant. They're brands that produce miraculous new things. They're brands I need to take me into the future. They're my Jeep Cherokee. What are the brands people hate? That Washington wants to fool around with, regulate tax, dismisses all the time. A lot of our clients at Purple. The energy industry, the healthcare industry, financial services. Why? Because they're descendant. They had their day. I can tell you about an industry that used to be so sexy, so mm. ascendant, so forward looking, they made movies about it. 1950s. America back home from the war, the economy booming. Where are we going to get the energy to power this monstrously growing, optimistic country? Oh, the energy industry, oil. James Dean, Elizabeth Taylor. The oil industry was Apple. What happens over time? Things that produce miraculous new benefits become familiar. The familiar becomes commonplace. The things that are always around, that are always there, they have no value. Energy. I flick my light switch. I get in my car. Great. Terrific. Love it. But that's always there. Why do those people make all that money? Health care. We've got the best in the world. Terrific. But that's always there. Why do those people make all that money? These industries have lost touch with the future. They can't tell us why we need them to take us to the next great place. That doesn't just happen to companies. It doesn't just happen to industries. It happens to countries and it's happened to political parties. It's happened to the Republican Party. We're the party of no, not the party of next. Another bit of evidence. What's the job of leadership in America? We asked on a survey question, who are the great modern American presidents? This is what America told us. The great modern presidents, FDR, hmm. Kennedy, Reagan. These guys seem to have something in common. FDR, 20% unemployment, 900 bank failures. Who's FDR? The New Deal, right? We have nothing to fear but fear itself. He's kind of an up arrow guy, isn't he? Transformational leader. JFK, Sputnik. Oh my God, the future belongs to the Soviets, not the United States? Really? Uh-uh, not JFK. He says new frontier. By the way, we're going to go to the moon in 10 years. You know why? Because we feel like it. We're Americans. We do that kind of stuff. Reagan, the ash heap of history? No, that's for the Soviets. America has a rendezvous with destiny. Up arrow. Clinton, kind of lost in the moral abyss of the 80s and the me generation, but who's Clinton? Don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Bridge to the 21st century. Go, baby. <laughs> They're all the same guy. Every single one of them, they're the up arrow. They're transformational leaders. They're ascendant. And then, of course, we put up a 70-year-old fighter pilot, and they put up hope and change. Gee, I wonder how we lost that one. What is the job of leadership in America? In uncertain times, job of the leaders to be Moses, to say, follow me, there's a better place for you over the horizon. Lift your eyes. The job of Moses did not say, however, hey, I got a great idea, people. Let's go to the desert. It's really hot. Kind of thirsty, kind of long, dry, but you know what? You'll prove your principles. Moses did not do that. He viewed the job of, diff of leadership differently. He said, there's a place for you, the promised land, given to you by God. It's a special thing. Let us go there. Now, this desert thing, we've got to get through that, but we can do it.
Transformational leaders are what America looks for. That's the job of political leadership. One more bit of evidence. What was the difference in 2010 and 2012? 2010, you'll remember, Republicans picked up 60 seats in the House. 2012, we spent a billion dollars to lose an election against Barack Obama that many Republicans think we should have won. We could have lost that election for only half a billion. Saved a lot of money. What happened? Well, 2010, if you remember, Democrats controlled the House, they controlled the Senate, and they controlled the White House. Three accelerators on the car, no brake pedal. America looked at Washington and said, what are those people doing up there? And the answer was anything they want. Passing a huge 3,000-page health care bill. Yanking 500 pages out of it overnight, putting in 600 pages. We're going to spend a trillion dollars to save money? How's that going to work? It wasn't about health care. America was concerned that Washington was just out of control. So what did they do? Three accelerators? Ah, let's put a brake pedal on that car. 2010, America looked over at those Republicans over there and said, I'm not sure those guys are good for much, but they seem to be pretty good at saying no. So America tapped the brake pedal. We took Congress. 2012, we just put a brake pedal on the car. Need two? No. America wanted renewal. Get us going. Move us forward. Take us to a better place. America doesn't trust the Republican Party one inch beyond no. And 2012, we proved that. So here's the choice, the political dynamic that obtains today. Democrats are the party that promises more from government, more security, more stuff. And by the way, Mitt Romney was wrong. It's not for 47% of the people. It's for everybody. All of us. And Republicans are the party that guarantees less austerity. Gee, given that choice, which would I take? I was talking to Haley Barber not long ago, and Haley said, Alex, I don't know, maybe it's too late. How can Republicans compete with the Democratic promise of more? We can't outbid Democrats more from Washington. And then we both looked at each other and said, oh my God, wait a minute. Are we crazy? We can't promise more from Washington. But the idea that we couldn't promise more from our economy, more from America, that's what America's all about. The idea that if you work hard, play by the rules, you can achieve anything. And somehow the Republican Party has become the party that's afraid to even use the word more. So here's the choice, I think, the way the news media frames it, and by the way, the way Republicans and Democrats have accepted it. Either Republicans can keep talking about their principles the way they do now and keep losing, or behind door number B, they can compromise their principles, become Democrats light, and keep losing. Gee, what a great hand of cards that is. Yes, there is. A lot of Republicans talk about going back to Goldwater. Going back to Reagan, excuse me. That's how old I am, I'm going back to Goldwater. Going back to Reagan. If we only went back to Reagan. But you know, Reagan didn't go back to Goldwater. He could have echoed Goldwater. He could have repeated it. He could have said just, I'm all about anti-big government and anti-communism. Reagan didn't do that. Reagan was that transformational leader. Reagan came along and said, in addition to all that stuff, we do have a rendezvous with destiny. Americans can achieve anything. He added optimism. A Republican smiled for the first time in recorded history. Oh, my Lord. And my contention is that it is our job in our time to do for our party what Reagan did in his time for his party. Not abandon your principles, but move them ahead. How do you do that? Here's the fun part. Look around. It's easy. Are there any Democrats here in the audience? No, no need to be embarrassed. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. America needs it. Why does the Democratic Party think the way it does? Because it works. 
<laughs> All right, that's a better answer than one I've got. Mine is only true. There's a way of thinking there that is a product of a time. The world of Newton, the emergence of science, the industrial age. Imagine that you're there and Henry Ford is standing around with a bunch of guys. They're looking at a car and old Henry says, guys, I got an idea. We don't have to make these things one at a time. Holy smokes. The world change. The industrial age. And look what it built. The most muscular productive economy in human history. 5% of the world's people producing 25% of the world's wealth and prosperity. What a great idea, the industrial age. Top down, producing uniformity, standardization. So what do you do if you have something that works like that? If that's your understanding of the world, Newton's world. The world is a clock, cogs and gears. You can look at it, see it run, I understand it. I'll tweak it, I'll make it better. Well, then that's how you model solving problems, isn't it? And that's government's job. So what do you do? You create a big old factory in Washington and you start cranking out Model Ts. What a wonderful idea, except for one thing. We don't live in that world anymore. You don't. Your world is not the world of the factory. You're in the communications age. Big, dumb, slow, top-down things aren't the world you're familiar with. What world are we moving into? We're entering a new era, ultra-responsive, hyper-connected, bottom-up, information age world, a world of complex systems and adaptive agents. What does that mean? That means science understands the world differently today. The old way science looked at the world was science would look at New York City and go, who's planning on how to get food and groceries to seven million people in New York City? The old answer was nobody, right? Unplanned, no top down. The new answer is no, no, everybody. It's an emergent structure. It's people self-organizing. It's a billion subtle and elegant transactions one to another. One brain cell can't think, many can. How does that happen? That's cool. Emergent structures. There's a place called the Santa Fe Institute. This is what they study, the world of emergent structures and adaptive agents. This is how they understand life the world, social systems, economies. Complex adaptive systems. You know the old factory? Government, that was a great idea when you were the cog in the gear, right? One minor problem. You're now informed in ways you've never been. You're now connected in, to each other in ways you've never been. You're now empowered to make choices in ways you've never been before. Oh my God. The cogs and gears have learned to talk back. They've learned to make choice. They've learned to move. How are you going to run the old factory that way? It doesn't work. George Gilder's written a book about that, The Economy. There's another great book out there. The uh, title is, What do you do when the smartest person in the room is the room? That's a different world we're living in, isn't it? Well, it turns out that Republicans have kind of believed this all along. We thought the hand was invisible, but no, today you can actually see it at work. So, a little history lesson. Any color you want, as long as it's black, right? Good idea. We don't live in that world anymore. So what do we do? We model government like that. Model T government. Democrats still demand old, factory-style, top-down, inflexible, standardized, and no choice. That's what factories can do. How many people here remember when your TV market only had three stations? That's all you could get on your box. I do. Sad to report. When you had one newspaper, maybe two in your town. News was what? Top-down, filtered, standardized. There are now 180 million blogs. We don't get our news. Those things at the top, they're going out of business. We get our news from each other. We get our news bottom up in an open system, not top down in a closed system. 
The path to success used to be conformity, fit in, stay in your box the rest of your life, you cog and gear. Jeb Bush sent me this one. Do you know how many people now make most of their income from eBay, a little business on eBay? 1.5 million Americans and growing. Everyone different. And you're going to fit those people into the next Washington, Great Washington plan? Good luck with that. When I grew up, knowledge was static. It sat on a shelf my entire educational career. On occasion, I would walk by it. Can you even imagine knowledge being that static, that top-down, that standardized? No. Our knowledge grows and changes. It comes from each other. We live in a very different open world. The whole world has changed, but one big, dumb, slow, top-down, factory-like thing hasn't. Today's world demands bottom-up, responsive ways of meeting the challenges of an adaptive world. Good news for Republicans is this is kind of what they've always believed. And look at how you can describe the old world and the new. Top down, inflexible, control, unchanging, standardized, slow. And look how you can describe the new world. I can sell one of these a lot easier than I can the other. There's a story here Republicans can tell. So how's the big old factory style government working for us right now? This is what a word cloud of what the Ameri how the American people describe the old factory style government. I think that sucks is a scientific term there. Not so hot, huh? We have the world's largest government, right? What does it govern? What does the old factory actually govern? Well, how about education? How's that doing? Eh. Kids are falling out of educational system at unprecedented levels. And, but they're only dropping out of education. They're dropping out of their futures. We have an educational system that's driving kids into prison, real ones, or prisons of poverty and despair. How's education working for us? The old factory, not so hot. Oh, retirement. Does it govern retirement? Well, not really. We all know it is a Ponzi scheme. It is unfunded. It is not going to have enough young people, that would be you, to pay for the old people. That would be me. Work harder. <laughs> does it govern, does the old factory govern the economy? I think we can kind of blow by that one. How about uh, our fiscal affairs? Does the old factory govern that? How are we doing there? They govern nothing. Oh, no, well, thank heavens, at least it works for Obamacare. The problem with Obamacare, I think Republicans have been talking about it the wrong way. The problem is not that this is the worst the old factory can do. I think the problem is this is the best they can do. Big, dumb, slow, top-down bureaucracy, ossified, layers and layers. Businesses would have done it differently because businesses are built differently. They would have done it bottom-up. So the same old thinking gets us where? The same old place. Maybe it's time for a change. Think about the world you're moving into. Think about the world you're going, that hyper-connected world, that bottom-up world. It can't achieve its potential. You can't achieve your potential. Without what? Freedom. The freedom to adapt, to make choices. If we hadn't invented freedom, this country would need to invent it today just for the world we're moving into. Freedom isn't a dusty idea on a shelf. It's what's next. So if the old metaphor's top down the factory, okay? Right, that's how we understood the world. Good idea in its time. What are the new metaphors? What rings true in your world? One, hyper-connected. The age of information and communications. These are things 
when we talk to the next generation, when we talk to folks, we don't have to sell them that open is better than close. We don't have to explain that bottom up is better than top down. That's your experience. You live it. We don't have to force a choice like that. We can just say, which one would you like? Yes, that's my world. I understand that. When we look at the world, what do we also see? We don't see cogs and gears. We don't see society and economies and, and health care systems as machines. We see them as interrelated and connective and adapted, almost like a living thing. That's one reason we value words like natural and organic. That's one reason we pay so much for them at Whole Foods. They're better. They're truer to our experience. And then the third thing, there's this idea somebody had here about 200 years ago that your life meant something, that you had certain inalienable rights, that you weren't a cog in a gear, that you were empowered to determine your own future. It seems to have caught on. The whole idea of human rights, we don't have to explain that that's good. We know that fairness, that equal opportunity, not equal results, but equal opportunity is American. It's who we are. So three metaphors. That's how we tell stories. That's how we relate to each other. One thing to remember, I'll come back to this later if we want to talk about it. Eh, maybe not. We'll talk about it now. What the heck? So, Alex, you're talking about equal opportunity and openness and all that, but that ain't your cranky party. You're still the party of no. You're the party of unequal opportunity. You have social conservatives in your party that tell you how you're going to live your life. And yes, we do. And that's a problem. Because if the GOP is supposed to be the party of freedom, how can we be the party that advocates less of it? What do people see if they see the Republican Party contradicting its very core? They think we're a party that's insincere, and they're right to think so. If the factory can't do a good job on the economy, if it can't do a good job on education, if it can't do a good job on health care, no, but it can do a great job in your bedroom. That's going to be a tough sell. The Republican Party is not against rules. The Republican Party is not against values. The Republican Party, freedom is not incompatible with values. As a matter of fact, freedom without values, without rules, is anarchy. And we as Republicans know this. But do those rules have to come from Washington, D.C., for top down from the old factory? There's a great little book I would recommend to you called Freedom Nationally, Values Locally, Virtue Locally. You're seeing the Republican Party head in this direction under Rand Paul. You, the next generation, has never been told what to do by anybody. You're the most empowered generation of Americans we've ever seen. I've hired some of you, I know. You all think you're Secretary of State. The most empowered generation ever. We can't tell that next. That's what, by the way, where all the energy is in the Republican Party with Rand Paul. We Republicans can't tell the next generation, yes, here's how you're going to live your life. But can we get the Rand Paul Libertarian and the Rick Santorum Evangelicals under one umbrella? Yes. And that umbrella is freedom nationally, values locally. Can we all agree that it's not Washington's job to tell us how to live that? Yes, keep your values. We're not asking anyone to change. But can we agree on the role of government, that it's not the moral policeman? That's where the party is headed. <coughs> Our faulty graphic mistranslated. That's supposed to say 2014 debates ain't answers. Oh. So let's put this all this great theory stuff we've just talked about to work as we close up. There's going to be a debate in November, probably right here. And there's going to be a Democrat and there's going to be a Republican. And this is how that debate's going to go if Republicans do not change, if Republicans do not move forward, if Republicans don't understand that their ideas and their principles are what's needed to move ahead. 
the debate would go like this. I'm the Democrat. Well, our economy sucks, but thank God I'm here. I've got a new program. I'm going to tax this wealthy looking gentleman right over there. He obviously has not been paying his fair share. True? True. Okay. And then I'm going to create a new program. The government program is going to help you. It's going to create jobs, maybe, this time. Almost. Even though it actually never has before. But at least I'm trying. And my Republican opponent over here, all he can do is say no. Then it would be the Republicans' turn to stand up. And if nothing changes, here's how his part of the debate would go. He would stand up and say, that's right. And then sit down. Because that's kind of where we are, right? We're no. We only think our principles are good for saying no. But what if that debate went a little differently? What if the Democrats said exactly the same thing? I got an idea, tax you, new program, might work, at least I'm trying, eh, no guy over here. What if the Republican didn't play by the old rules and instead said, you know what, I am so glad you want to grow the economy. I want to grow it too. I just have one question for you. Why do you want to do it the old way? The old way? I'm a Democrat. I've got a new program. No, no, no. Why do you want to do it the old way? Why do you want to grow the economy top down, politically and artificially from Washington? Hasn't worked in decades. Why don't we try something fresh? A Republican saying fresh? What? Yeah, why don't we try something fresh? Why don't we try growing the economy naturally and organically? Not politically and artificially. Why don't we try growing the economy bottom up instead of top down? Why don't we plant the seeds of growth? Organic metaphor again. Why don't we plant the seeds of growth not in the barren concrete of Washington? Nothing grows there. Why don't we plant the seeds of growth in the fertile soil of your economy, where you live, where you work, where you save, where you invest? Natural, bottom-up, organic, economic growth. One, it's a heck of a lot better than no. And two, it's an intellectual, moral, and political rationale that says, follow me, we can go to a better place. So we can keep debating more versus no. But there's a better way for a Republican to explain what they believe. Now, why do we need new ideas, new policies, and language? Because if you paint the house the same color, nobody knows you painted the house. We're the same old no guys. So yes, we can keep talking about free enterprise and all the old buzzwords. But that's not going to say there's something new happening here. Another issue, in addition to bottom-up natural economic growth, we just had Bobby Jindal and Jeb Bush come up to D.C. for equal opportunity in education previously known as school choice. What's the difference? Bobby Jindal, by the way, is being sued by the Justice Department because he is trying to help 90%, a group of kids that's 90% black, 100% poor, who are trapped in D and F rated schools. He's trying to let them escape to better schools. And somehow that's discriminatory. So we came up, we did a survey for him on equal opportunity in education. Do you favor or oppose what is known as equal opportunity in education? That is giving lower income parents the right to use some of their tax dollars to choose the best public or private school for their child. 6726. But here's the even better news. Among independents, 7222. Among African Americans, 6826. Among Hispanics, 7323. Huge numbers, 80% among women. Equal opportunity in education. Why? Because it's the future. It's the way we understand our world. The idea that everyone should have equal opportunity in this country. It shouldn't matter what neighborhood a child lives in or how much money their parents make. All children should have an equal opportunity to get a good quality of education. 95 to 3. Can the Democratic Party go there? Not without tearing itself apart. Why? The teachers unions. A vested interest. 
How do you win elections? Split the other guys, maximize your side. This is an issue that does that. But more importantly, it does something else. It's better than no. It's something positive and optimistic that says, follow us. We've got a way to make things better. Should my child, the Democratic Party argument these days is what? Oh, no, let's wait and fix the public schools. Well, kind of haven't we been working on that for about 40 years? Meanwhile, there's a child in school today. I'm dying to have a Republican go into the inner city, to go into the barrio, to stand in front of the NAACP and say, you know what, I know two great parents in Washington. And they chose the best school for their two beautiful daughters. God bless them. Michelle and Barack Obama. Whatever we think politically, we can agree they're great parents. Now, how about you? What about your kids? Shouldn't they have equal opportunity to choose the best school? Your parents to choose the best school for their kids? Shouldn't every child have equal opportunity to go to the place that gives them the best shot at life? How hard is it? Let the money follow the child instead of letting the child follow the money. We can do that. Have Republicans go into the inner city with a message that says, you know what, there's some child out here right now that's failing, that's going to drop out. They're condemned to it in the system that we have unless we change. There are tons of these kids, and one of them could be the one that comes up with the next great idea and the next great invention and the next great iPhone. One of them could be the one that comes up with maybe the most important success of all, the next great family. We don't know which child it is. So what we got to do is save them all, every single one. That's what the Republican Party believes. That's what the Republican Party needs to be saying. Top down or bottom up, 85 to 11. Open, zoned versus closed, 64 to 22 for open. You don't have to explain. It's the world we're moving into. And here's the best news for Republicans. Since it is true about the world we're moving into, it's organic, open, bottom up, all these things, it works for every issue. Do you want an open health care system or a closed one? Do you want a top-down health care system where politicians make political and artificial decisions about you and your health and your life, perhaps at the most important moment in your life? Or do you want a bottom-up health care system where you and your doctor make decisions naturally bottom-up together? Do you want an open energy economy or a closed one? It works on everything. Oh, we even tested the Michelle Obama question. Not so bad. So, what are the ideas? What are the differences? I hope soon you'll have a better choice. I hope soon the Republican Party steps up and starts offering a choice. No, we've got a better way to do that. Why aren't we past the old way, the old factory style way of doing things? Why don't we try something new? Instead of bottom up, instead of top down, let's try bottom up. Instead of closed or zone, let's try an open system. Instead of the factory, something warm, genuine, authentic, organic. These are the contrast. A generation of kids that has never been told what to do. Choose. Do you want your government to be to require towing the line, standardization, and conformity? Or do you want a bottom-up government that's open, that offers everyone the opportunity for innovation, freedom of choice, and diversity? That's where I think the Republican Party is headed. And that's the choice uh, that I hope our next generation of candidates makes. One of the prices you pay in politics, the heaviest prices you pay in politics is the price you pay for success. George Bush was president for eight years. Big tree. Nothing new grows under the shade of a big tree. Now the tree is gone, and we're seeing new generation of candidates come up. Now there's a big tree on the Democratic side. And they're going to be struggling to find that new generation of leadership. As ugly as our politics is, I think this is a transformative moment for it. 
out of all this ugliness, something new is happening. I think change is coming to Washington, primarily because your generation is not satisfied with more of the same. So that's why I'm optimistic about it. That's why I, uh, we're starting this new Republican.org to try to move our party in the right direction. And if you guys got any questions, let's get at it. We got some, uh, didn't run over too bad, I think. Who's got a question? Yes, ma'am. Can I speak loud Yes, ma'am, absolutely you can. One question you didn't ask was who are the independent voters in this room? This is New Hampshire. New Hampshire. 40% of us are independent. Yes. We don't align ourselves with either party. And you hit the nail right on the head, as far as I'm concerned, when you talked about how much of a conundrum it is when you talk about freedom and all of that, and then you have the religious right and the grand <coughs> <coughs> people like me. I'm a businesswoman, and I'm a baby boomer, and I'm an independent voter. And I find it offensive when politicians get up and espouse freedom and all the rest of it, and then tell me how they want me to, which church I should go to, and who's going to be in my bedroom. And I worry about that. And I just like your Well. I would recommend reading Freedom Nationally, Virtue Locally, because I think it's a kind of, of republicanism that you might be more comfortable with. Um, it is, I think, a conflict for the Republican Party to be the party of, that advocates freedom, but then less of it, especially when it comes to you know the most intimate thing in your personal life. But I would make this case to Rand Paul, and I would make the, another case to Rick Santorum. To Rand Paul, I'd say, look, you're not for anarchy, are you? You, you, have, you want lines on the side of the road. They're rules. You, you don't want a completely chaotic society. He will probably say no. He just doesn't think they should be from Washington. I'm sure Miss, uh, you know, Rand Paul's married. I'm sure Mrs. Rand Paul believes in some rules, right? But to the conservatives, I would say, are you a big government conservative? Is that what you are then? Tell me. If you want to say so, step up and say it. Are you a big government social conservative? Do you cheat? You say you're not a big government conservative on the economy. You say you're not a big government conservative on health care. You say you're not a big government conservative on education, all those things. But you're going to tell me now you're a big government conservative on social issues and on what happens in people's private lives. Oh, okay. Once you challenge people like that, what happens? They got a fish or cut bait. And again, I don't think it is our job in the Republican Party to tell people where they paint the lines on the side of their road. I think it is our job in the Republican Party to create a big tent underneath which we can all agree on the role of government. It's not big, dumb, slow, top-down factories job to police that to do that moral cram down. And if you really want a society that is virtuous and moral, you have no choice but to think that because the more we have surrendered to Washington and to big top-down government, the moral power to police us, the more our society's fallen apart. They're not doing a very good job. The responsibility for being virtuous, for transmitting our culture, those are individual responsibilities. They belong in our families, and they belong in our churches, and they belong in our schools. That's your job. That's not something you can outsource to the public sector. So that's how I would challenge conservatives. You're not conservative enough if you cheat. Another question. Good evening, Mr. Castellanos. Hey. My name is Nicole Flores, and I'm a... a I teach theology, Christian social ethics here at St. Anselm College. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your wisdom with us here this evening. I'm really excited that there are so many students here to listen to what you have to say and to consider it seriously. Uh, so I'm originally from Denver, Colorado, and uh, I'm Mexican-American, and uh, I have a father who voted for Reagan, and he hasn't voted for a Republican since. So I sit down with my father uh, before the last election, and I said, Dad, uh, you know, you are 
Catholic, you uh, don't like taxes, you are trying to start a small business, uh, uh, what is it that makes you want to vote uh, for a Democrat as opposed to a Republican? And he tells me, you know, Mika, I should be able to be a Republican. I'm the ideal, you know, sort of target person for a Republican. But I watch, and we call him Randy the Sign Guy. He's like Joe the Plumber. He's very, he's a working guy, but he's very smart. And he says, I watch the news and I watch what's going on. And I feel like voting for a Republican is voting against my own best interests, that there, there isn't enough going on in terms of, uh, addressing issues of equality or addressing immigration reform or addressing issues of race and racism. And I think you, Mr. Castellanos, are in a very good response, excuse me, a good position to give me a response to bring back to my father. What, how do you respond to that? How do you respond to someone who feels like they, can, they might be able to align themselves with the interests of the Republican Party but feel like they, they can't due to these uh, very important hot button issues? <laughs> Well, there go the next three hours, gang. <laughs> That's a lot of ground to cover. Uh, I'd say a couple of things, and, and I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate the question. Uh, it means a lot personally to me. Um, one, I would say that right now the Republican Party is not a party people want to join. We're negative, we're cranky, we're not welcoming. The worst thing that can happen to a candidate or a party in a political campaign is not when voters decide that they don't like you. It's when voters decide you don't like them. Why would you want to be a part of that? I think a lot of it on the Republican side stems from our loss of faith in, in our vision. When a sailboat's dead in the water, and we're all on it, and we're running out of supplies. What happens? More for you means less for me. We get into this, and you know what? We can talk all we want, but there isn't much of a way to litigate our way out of that. How do you solve those problems? You get the boat going again. You go to a better place. You go to some place that offers more promise and possibility. And all of a sudden, the people start working together. And those intractable problems you thought you had don't seem as hard. Because you not only have a common mission, there's, there's the promise of something better. We're missing that today. One reason we can't address our immigration problems is because we're letting our tough times bring out our worst and not our best. The other thing I would say specifically about immigration is that there was a top-down immigration solution offered in Washington. Oh, we're going to do comprehensive immigration reform. We're so smart. We haven't been able to make anything else work, but by God, we got this one. Thank God it's so simple. Well, that didn't work out so good. So then Republicans had a great idea. We'll come up with a new top-down, dumb, slow way of doing it. That was Senator Rubio. Well, guess what? It wasn't any better. What do we think is true about the world? What do we think? Open, bottom up. Why don't we try to actually put that to work on immigration, on an issue that matters? How would we do it? Right now, the political value of an immigrant and the economic value of an immigrant are not connected at all. If I'm a congressman, I can beat the hell out of an immigrant. But I can still get people to come to my district and my city and pick crops and raise kids and start businesses. I get the economic benefit and the political benefit. Okay, how do you fix that? Step one, tell Washington to do its job. We have a border, good. Secure the border, protect the border. That's what a nation is. But Washington, why are you telling us who we need here? You don't know. That's our job. Let Listen to us. Let us tell you. And if Arizona decides, you know what, we don't want any immigrants. Okay, fine. Good job, Arizona. American business will make a choice. And if Mississippi decides, hey, we need blood here, fresh blood. We need energy. We need ideas. We need bright minds that come from our colleges and go back and start business somewhere else. Then business will go there bottom-up solution would be a lot more effective to immigration for immigration reform than another top-down Washington knows best failure which is probably what will happen again another question yes, 
Yes, you should. Hello, Alex. Uh, I actually saw you at the College Republican Convention in D.C., so that's where I, I got it. Awesome. So, um, we're, in, we're infecting your youth. <laughs> spread the word. So um, I was going to ask, um, because obviously um, you were definitely one of my favorite presentations at that convention. Um, certainly the College Republicans in New Hampshire are doing uh, the best they can to certainly spread the word about this and, and essentially the beliefs you are talking about today. But in the meantime, because it is going to take time, you know, we, we, we try to talk to the candidates and their staffs about, about these ideas and everything like that, and it's going to take time to get a, a, you know, a solid field of new Republicans. In the meantime, so right, like right now, what do we do about the old Republicans? And, I, and, <laughs> um, and you know, it's like I'm someone who I'm, I, I will tattoo the words party unity on my forehead if I have to. Yep. But at the same time, um, you know, even specifically, I'd like to maybe reflect on the Virginia governor's race. Um, you have a nominee, Ken Cuccinelli. A lot of college Republicans I've been Virginia. talking to are very okay. hesitant because he's someone who's trying to promote sodomy laws and is very anti-gay marriage and is focusing on social issues. And we are like, stop talking about those things. And uh, we have a lot of people who are maybe even thinking about voting for the libertarian Robert Sarvis because he's all for these economic opportunity bullet points and for the open-minded social issue bullet points. So are we to hold our nose and vote Republican if we vehemently disagree with that path? Or Another good question. Another where, good question. Where do we go? What do we do in this, in this well, a, meantime, if you will? Uh, a couple of thoughts on that. Here's the good news. Us old Republicans will kick the bucket one day. <laughs> so good news. That's a problem that eventually will take care of itself. Um, how do you transform? Folks, you know, I used to think a lot more linearly than I do. Now you plant a seed here. It's kind of the cloud theory of life. You, you plant enough seeds here and there, and one day the world changes. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do, little by little. Uh, you know, the brand managers in Washington are the pollsters and the consultants. As soon as they see something begin to work, they share it, they spread it, and all of a sudden it grows. Candidates see something that works here and moves over there. So, you know, you, you try to get an exponentially uh, growing process going. And I think that happens. Now, specifically about Virginia. You know, it was been so great to have a Republican race in the shadow of the nation's capital where you had a choice between old versus new. Instead, we have two guys who can't possibly win running against each other. Uh, it is a tough race, you know? Um, and it's almost intractable. You could drop a bomb on that race and you don't move numbers because it's just about who these two candidates are. And I'll, I won't go into their, their individual weaknesses uh, other than to say that if Cuccinelli were a candidate who weren't hemmed in by that conflict of being a small government conservative, a bottom-up conservative on a lot of these economic, health care issues, you know, education, but a big government social conservative, he would have walked away with this race. And, uh, and I think, so will we learn anything from this race? I hope we learn that. And if we, if Republicans, by the way, to your point, which I think is dead on the money, if Republicans don't step up and a, embrace a freedom nationally values locally approach, there will be a third party. There will be a libertarian only candidate. And if, if that is split, then Terry McAuliffe is going to end up president. God help us. Yikes. Any other questions? Who's got a question? Aha. Uh -huh. Hi. Um, I actually think the Republican Party's worst enemy is the Republican Party because they kind of turn into a circular firing squad. Is that the right term? I mean, I think Rand Paul and Ted Cruz have been doing amazing things. And then the John McCains and the Lindsey Grahams and the Kelly Ayotts attack them because they don't like that they're standing out on a limb and, and I don't I mean I think they're actually standing up for what a lot of people think I mean maybe not everyone but instead they're trying to distance so it, it creates this battle 
between the Republican Party and the old guard doesn't want to give up so easily. And I, I think that that's the biggest part, problem with the Republican Party because when people say, okay, I want to support a Republican, they're like, oh, you like John McCain? No, I like Ted Cruz. Or, you know what I mean? It's yep. kind of got its own inner battle going on, and I think that's the biggest problem, personally. Uh, we, we have met the enemy, and, and it is us. Oh, yeah. Um, to your point, the last people who will change are the people who are in Washington and have become successful doing exactly what they're doing now. Change will come from the bottom up. Change will come from the outside in. Um, that's us. And that's, by the way, in both parties. Some of the things I've talked about today, pick up a book called Citizenville by Gavin Newsom. I did a meet the press with him a few months ago, and uh, I want to check this guy out, read his book. In California, where you would have thought not a single new idea would come from California, that place has burned to the ground. They've burnt down their government and bankrupted it. And guess what? It's like a forest. When you burns down, that's where the new shoots come up. They have no choice but to think differently. Gavin Newsom's got a book about governing outside the private sector. You know? Why do we need to send money all the way up there when we can have C-click fix locally right here and fix a pothole? Governing outside the, the old factory. That's, hey, there, there's more than one tool in our toolbox. This is from a Democrat who's thinking differently. As far as Republicans eating their own, I would say that the jury is still out on Ted Cruz for this reason. Ted Cruz stepped up very courageously. Hey, I said I would take on Obamacare and I will. No exit strategy, no strategy for success, no door out of the room. And he has run a very effective campaign just like Republicans did in 2010. The no campaign, the stop it campaign, the brake pedal campaign. And you know what? We picked up seats. There's a place for that. You need to tell people now and then, don't touch the hot stove. Now and then you need to tell people, you yell fire in, in the theater because there's a fire. But ultimately, don't touch the hot stove is not enough. Ultimately, you got to cook something, feed people. You need to have a vision. You need to have a way forward. If Ted Cruz takes this party in the direction of only no, that our principles are only good for saying no, he will be a destructive force. He will teach us the wrong lesson in this coming year, just like we learned the wrong lesson in 2010. If Ted Cruz understands that in addition, in addition to stopping bad things, people are in this uncertain moment, when you're lost, when you fear for the future of your country, people are looking for a little hope and vision and a rationale intellectually, morally, politically, that says there's a better place. What we believe is good for saying yes and getting in that Jeep Cherokee and going somewhere. If he can do that, he'll be in a much better position and so will the rest of us. But right now the jury's still out. We don't know if, if he is, if the, where the road will take him to bring out our worst or to bring out our best, in my view. Who else? Curious lot. Go good, good, good. I, I also think that there's a huge opportunity for the Republican Party to get on um, our privacy issues as far as the NSA, the Patriot Act, um, the NDAA, indefinite detention. I, I think there's a huge opportunity there because I think that that's the most important thing and for all of us is our freedoms and our privacy. And the government is ever intruding into this. And I just think that that's well, a huge opportunity. If they speak to that, the young people will, I mean, I'm a Ron Pauler. Ron Paul talked liberty and freedom. He had me at hello. Yep. And I mean, I know that he was marginalized a lot in the press and all of those things. Oh, he wants to legalize drugs and blah, 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 blah. I mean, whatever. But he talked about liberty and freedom. And that's something every individual values. A couple, couple of thoughts there. One is that 
that is the next generation. And uh, demography is only destiny if you let it. This country has been changing demographically for 200 years. Both parties have adapted to it and need to continue to do so. We should. Um, as far as uh, the NSA and privacy issues, I might have to disagree with you there because I feel very comforted knowing that if my hard drive crashes, the NSA can back it up for me. <laughs> Think how much we'd save. Uh, no, those are real, real issues, intrusive uh, and intrusive, ha uh, the hand of the government. You know what we have seen this past week? Something remarkable, and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Washington is closing beaches. How can you close a beach that's been there a billion years? They're closing mountains. They've closed 1,100 square miles of ocean off Key Biscayne in Florida. In other words, they have, since, they're, since the government has no money and had to shut down, they've taken more money to put people in boats on the ocean to keep people out of this 1,100 square miles. Only, only the big old dumb slow factory would think that's their job. So those privacy issues, it is a choice between old and new. One other thing I'd point out, Republicans for years have been going up to young people, to everybody and going, ooh, big government, expecting them to, you know, think it's Halloween and soil themselves at that moment. Oh my God, big government. And young people go, huh? Because big isn't always bad. Big is good. If, if big is this, I'm connected to a big world with this. Google is big. Freedom is big. Choice, I want choices to be big. Democracy's big. If big is bottom up and empowers me and gives me more choices and options, big is good. If big is old and top down and limits my choices and enforces conformity, big is bad. The choice isn't big. The choice is old and new, open or closed. And those are some of the issues I think that's where the Rand Paul folks, I think, are dead on the money there. What else we got? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm from Massachusetts, and I'm a Republican, so figure, go figure. All right. He made it out alive. Let's give this man a hand here. But I was born a Democrat, okay? When I, but when I finally woke up and turned around, I was a Republican. If my father was alive today, he'd be you know, Who knew? Who knew? Rate, <laughs> In the 90s, we wanted to re-engineer Washington, D.C. Newt Gingrich came up with the contract with America. A list, mm -hmm. boom, boom, boom. We're going to do this, this, this. That's what we need. Yeah. We have to stop the madness. This is crazy. But, you know, every Republican, like you said, the Democrat can get up there and say whatever he wants with impunity. There's no recrimination. Whatever he says, he can get away with. But a Republican gets up there and he's not running against just the candidate he's up against. He's running against... The, the educrats, he's running against the, 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 the media, he's running against Hollywood, he's running against the whole world. There's no, and you're in the middle, you're in the belly of the beast, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh. We need, you're right, we need a leader. We need someone who's going to say, we're going there, and let's go. Where is he? Well, some good points there. The hard part of this is hard to write a movie with just a script and no leading man or woman. That's the role presidential races have played. You get the protagonist. You get somebody fighting a great battle. And in that battle, campaigns don't pick candidates. They make candidates. It's a brutal process. It's a brilliant process. These people grow. You've seen it happen here. It happens in front of you first. That's our job now, at least of what we're trying to do, is to plant those seeds so that when that candidate ripens, when they grow, they don't have just the same old story to advance. They have something fresh. As far as the media goes, media's job is to be destructive. There's no such thing as good news, right? Hey, absolutely nothing happened today. I'm not going to pay a nickel for that. That's their job, creative destruction, great. It is our job, however, to create something passionate, to create something inspiring, 
to create something, if we can't, if we're right and we can't explain how that in a marketable, popular, and attractive way, not the media's fault, it's ours. And that's what we're failing to do. Another example of that, technology. Ooh, Republicans are behind in technology, social media, oh my God. We better go out there and spend a billion dollars and fix it. Uh-uh, that ain't going to work. Why ain't it going to work? Because the same technology was available for Republicans that was available for, for Obama. Why didn't it work for us? Because we're not a party people want to join. Because nobody wants to sign up for no. Would you like some less? Gee, people didn't throng, flock to us. I'm shocked. But, and that's where we are right now. If you build a church without Jesus, you get a warehouse. You got to have an idea. You got to have something that inspires. You got to have something that lifts people's hope and says, you know, if I have learned one thing in politics over 30 years, I think the most important thing would be this. People don't vote for the most valuable candidate. They vote for the candidate who makes them the most valuable. I've got one vote. I've got one opportunity. I love my country. I want to I want to succeed economically so I can care for my family and lock the doors at night. This I I want to what gives me the most value? It makes me because I want to be part of something bigger than just myself. And that's what that's how you make social media work. That's how you make all media work. That's how you capture you know, somebody's imagination. And we've seen candidates on the Republican side and the Democratic side do it. Yes, sir. Did you raise your hand? I thought so. Question? No? Anything else, guys? I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you because what you're doing here is important. You are at the entry ramp here. For politics, it'll all pass through you. You are the filter. You're the first people to see it. You shape it probably more than anyone else. So stay active in it, you know. Punch it. Poke it. Keep doing what you're doing. It makes all the difference in the world. This ugly, horrible, conflictive, divisive process we have is awesome. It has created the best country in the world, and right now it is working really hard to take us to a better place. Thank you for letting me be here with you this evening. I had a great time. I hope, I hope you got something out of it. I got a mug. <laughs> we'll put booze in it later.